section 4.7 on, you know, it's called L'Hopital's Rule, the French mathematician, but we just said we're taking it to the hospital. I don't know why, it just looks too much like the hospital not to. But it's L'Hopital if you want the correct pronunciation. Okay? So suppose that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x over g of x equals Oh, and should I do infinity? No. Let me make it just, that's funny, x approach a, let's say. Suppose the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x is equal to 0 over 0. Now, when I write that, okay, what I'm saying is we know this is what's called an indeterminate form. Bless you. Then the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x will be equal to the limit as x approaches a of f prime of x over g prime of x. Okay. And a couple notes on this. Okay. Note. This even works if we replace A with infinity. So remember. I was going to write x infinity, x approaches infinity. We'll have some examples like that, but I think before I do that, we should just have it approach a number. And then maybe even more useful is also L'Hopital's rule works for other indeterminate forms. And we'll see some of those. We'll see those today on Monday. Other indeterminate forms. Okay. So, time for some examples. Well, maybe the first example, since we're staring right at it. We just talked about the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of x over x, right? This was a problem we needed, we didn't know how to do. We did prove it using the squeeze theorem that it's actually the limit does exist, right? So again, when I get when I get 0 over 0, basically the point is, right? Because the sine of 0 is 0 and x um, well, 0 is 0, right? The point is that when we write this, we're saying that this is f of a and this is g of a. That's the point. So you're getting 0 over 0. Once that happens, you can say that this limit must equal the limit as x approaches 0 of what? Well, you take the derivative of the top, and you get what? Cosine of x. You take the derivative of the bottom function, g of x equals x here, and what would that be? 1. And this is a limit you can compute, right? 
because you get the cosine of 0 over 1. And what's the cosine of 0? 1. So when I said the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x over x equals 1, if we know L'Hopital's rule, it's simple. Okay. Why didn't you show us that before? Because you didn't know how to find derivatives before. So it wouldn't have even helped yet. Okay. But now, so I guess I just answered my own question. Why do they show L'Hopital's rule in chapter 4? Because chapter 4 is called applications of derivatives. So you need to know derivatives. That's why it's in chapter 4. Okay. I have some other problems from the book picked out that I thought would be good. So let's do number 14, which is the limit as x approaches 1 of x to the fourth plus x cubed plus 2x plus 2 over x plus 1. Oh, that's kind of boring. The limit as x approaches 1, what would that be? <laughs> it would be 1, 2, 4, 6 over 2 is 3. Okay, what do you think the problem actually says? Limit as x approaches negative 1. So now I check that the bottom is 0 and the top would be, I have to check this. By the way, what happens, guys, if you get something non-zero over 0? Then what would you tell me? The limit's undefined, yes, because graphically what's going on if you have non-zero over 0? You have a vertical asymptote at that point, that's right. This is all a lot of good review. So let's see, we have negative 1 to the 4th plus negative 1 to the 3rd. And then when you plug in the negative 1, you get minus 2 plus 2. So sure enough, yeah, we get 0 over 0, right? So you need to check that that happens. When that happens, now you apply L'Hopital's rule. So you would say now, by L'Hopital's rule, This equals the limit as x approaches negative 1 of what? Well, we take the derivative, right? So what do you get? Four x to the third. Yep. Plus 2. And you also take the derivative of the denominator, so the denominator becomes 1. And so I guess, let's see, this looks like it's going to be negative 4 plus 3 plus 2. So that limit is 1. Jordan, do you have a question? No? Okay. So, could I have done this problem without L'Hopital's rule? I mean, you had these kind of problems before. What did you used to do when you got 0 over 0 instead of L'Hopital's rule? You try to factor it, yeah. So does that top term contain an x plus 1? I'm looking, I kind of see one here. If I take an x cubed out of the first two terms, I have an x plus 1. Right? And if I take a 2 out of the next two terms, I have an x plus 1. And the idea is if you factor out the x cubed plus, or the x plus 1s and then cancel them, you're just taking the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x cubed plus 2. Uh oh. I'm getting a different answer. Negative one, oh yeah, negative one plus two is still one. Okay. Good. So L'Hopital's rule is not always needed, but it's a nice tool to have in the tool toolkit. Let's put it that way. 
Then the other question is, why does L'Hopital's rule work? We haven't touched that yet. And the proof of that is a little deep. So we'll decide how far to go based on how much time we have, okay? I first want to get through some examples just getting you to use it. 22, we have the limit as z approaches zero of the tangent of 4z over the tangent of 7z. All right. Well, first of all, can I apply L'Hopital's rule at all? I have to check. Because what happens? You plug in, like what's the tangent of zero? Are we sure? Yes, because tangent, of course, means sine over cosine, right? And so if you're finding the tangent of zero, I guess what you're really doing is finding the sine of zero, which is zero. It's zero over one, okay? So maybe first thing to check, guys, is do you get zero over zero? Yes, we get that. Then what we're doing here is we're applying L'Hopital's rule. And so this will equal the limit as z approaches 0 of what? I'm going to pause while you guys gather your thoughts. So over on the side, I should probably comment on, on taking the derivative of this, right? You guys are trying to do the derivative with respect to z of the tangent of 4z. And I, for emphasis, I put the parentheses that are there, right? It's the tangent of 4z. It's not a product. It's a function of something. And so what rule comes into play when you have a function of another function? The chain rule, right? So let's use the chain rule. A little ding dong here. What do we get? We get secant squared of 4z times 4, because that's your dong, right? The derivative of what's inside. So what the book is going to do, if they're showing this as an example, they're going to, in one step, I mean, they're like, hey, these guys are in chapter 7. They're probably like Calc 2 students. They're good. They can just go right to this. 4 secant squared of 4z. They're not going to waste time showing that step. Okay? But I want to because we're in Calc 1 and we're already here. Over what? Good. 7 secant squared of 7z. And now we're going to take the limit as z approaches 0 of these things, OK? So this equals the limit as z approaches 0. And I'm going to write this a little bit bigger yet, because this is a complicated problem, I think. I mean, what does it mean to say secant squared of 4z? Yeah, what you're doing is you are squaring 1 over the cosine of 4z, and you're also squaring 1 over the cosine of 7z. Again, I do not think that your book in Chapter 7 is going to be showing this step, but it's what's really going on. They're kind of starting to say, oh, these guys get it. I can skip a step here or there. but. There's a lot going on in this problem. So I like going slow, especially when you're first learning a new process. So now, if I plug in z equals 0, do you guys see what happens? You get 1, right? Because it's 1 over 1 being squared as 1. So the final answer would be 4 sevenths. But I think that it takes some work to get there. What do you think, Tom? What's that? Nothing. Nothing. 
the limit as y approaches 2 of y squared plus y minus 6 all over. We have the square root of 8 minus y squared minus y. Okay. Well, first thing I better check is do I get an indeterminate form? So why don't you guys check that for me? Plug in some twos, huh? Four, six minus six. Yeah, I get zero in the top. And then down here, I'm taking the square root of eight minus four. Square root of four is two, minus two is zero. I got zero over zero. Is that good? So, what do we do? <laughs> we say, well, okay, this one's a little more involved, right? Because you have to take some harder derivatives. So I'm going to write it this way, guys. The limit as y approaches 2 of, the top is fine, y squared plus y minus 6, bless you. But the bottom, if we want to take a derivative, let's write that square root as, the one-half power, right, equals, so again, what I'm doing here is I'm using L'Hopital's rule. How about I just put L apostrophe H, and then you'll know what I mean, okay, a little shorthand. So this equals the limit as Y approaches 2 of, tell you what, I'll do the top, you do the bottom. So you guys do the bottom, and then we'll resume the recording here. So I'm going to compute the derivative. So I get, I'm going to write it kind of big so everyone can see. One half times eight minus y squared to the negative one half power times, what would it be? Negative two y and then minus one. Because of that minus 1, I can't flip it or anything, right? But this is the big mess I have. And so I guess, well, again, what is this equal? The numerator, it's easy to plug in a 5, right? The denominator, this takes a little more work. Limit as y approaches 2, and let me write this as a big ugly fraction minus 1. So the big ugly fraction, right, you would have negative y here. The 2 is going to cancel with the 1 half. And so it looks to me like what's in the denominator then? You'd have a square root of 8 minus y squared, right? What are you looking at, Jeff? That came from the bing, bing, the bong, right? There's the negative y. Where'd the 2 go? Cancel with the 1 half. Does this make sense so far? So now I plug in my 2, and I get 5 over, let's see, this is negative 2 divided by the square root of, well, it would be 4, right? Because it's 8 minus 4, minus 1. Yeah? So I get 5 over negative 1 minus 1, and so I'm getting negative 5 halves is the limit of that expression. You guys with me on this? I was just noticing something here. If they had put another negative sign right in front of the radical 
and you worked out the problem, when you got to the end, it would have said 1 minus 1 in the denominator. Then you would have had your 0 over 0. But I guess at the top, you would not have had 0 over 0. So you would have known a long time ago. You would have been in trouble. Duncan, question? Did you do the second? If you, so if you get 5 over 0, you can't do any more derivatives. But if you get a 0 over 0 again, yes, you might compute another derivative. That's actually, I think, the next example. Yeah. Problem 36. Here. Try this one. Limit. Remember I said you could sometimes replace the, um, you know, the, the, the number a with, a, with infinity. So... Here's a classic example, right? Actually, you guys are going to know the answer to this problem just from other things we did. 4x cubed minus 2x squared plus 6 over pi x cubed plus 4. Okay? Now, actually, do you guys know the answer to this problem? You probably should. Yeah. So if I want to find the limit as x goes to infinity, I'm finding basically a horizontal asymptote. Is it zero? And so what you do is you look at the degrees. Remember this? No, this is a long, well, good thing we're reviewing it, right? This is chapter two stuff. So the, the degree of the top is three, and the degree of the bottom is three. That tells you there's a horizontal asymptote. Well, maybe we'll just do it and see where it is. Then, then I think you'll remember. All right. So let's see. Oh, first of all, if I... Now, how do you plug in infinity? Well, if you do, this is what the book means by an infinity over infinity form, right? Because the, this one is growing and this one's growing, okay? So what this will equal using L'Hopital's rule. Again, the LH is the shorthand for L'Hopital. This is the limit as x approaches infinity of, well, take the derivative. What would you get in the top? 12x squared minus 4x. And in the bottom, I would get 3 pi x squared. Right? But again, this is still infinity over infinity, if you plug in infinity, right? So, we apply L'Hopital a second time, and this is what Duncan was just asking me. Apply L'Hopital's again. What's the numerator become now? 24x minus 4. Denominator becomes 6 pi x. Still, you get infinity over infinity. And this is starting to get annoying, but we'll do it again. And we'll apply L'Hopital a third time, and we'll say that this equals the limit as x approaches infinity of what? 24 over 6 pi. And the answer then must be 4 over pi. There are no more derivatives to take, you could say. There's, there's no variables, no, nothing to plug in. So yeah, here I'd use L'Hopital three times to get the answer. But do you remember anything from chapter 2 that would tell me it's going to be 4 over pi? Yeah. My, my leading coefficients were both... Is that valid to use every time? Yeah. Let me, let me show you why. Here's, here's the chapter 2 reason. Tom, Jordan, you guys all right? Talk to me. What's up? Nothing. Tell me. So, you guys, when you want to do this problem, here's how we used to do it the chapter uh, three way. We used to divide top 
and bottom by x cubed. See if you guys remember this at all. If you do that, you get 4x cubed over x cubed minus 2x squared over x cubed plus 6 over x cubed divided by pi x cubed over x cubed plus 4 over x cubed. And if you look at what happens here, this equals the limit as x approaches infinity of, well, that first fraction is just 4 over x. The next fraction would be, oh no, it's not 4 over x, it's just 4. The next fraction is 2 over x, and we still have a 6 over x cubed here. And in the denominator, we just get pi plus 4 over x cubed. But what's the point? All of these guys, what happens to these guys as x approaches infinity? They get small. They approach 0. So basically, the way we used to do this in chapter 2 was we'd divide, and then we'd just say, oh, the answer is 4 over pi. And actually, we did it enough times that we said, yeah, if the leading coefficients, if they're the same, if they're the same, if the leading term is the same degree, that is the coefficients is going to be the answer. You could prove that this way. Now that you have L'Hopital's rule, I guess you could prove it this way. Okay. So, a couple things going on there. Well. Let's try number 44 next. Again, I need a new page for this one. This is the limit as x approaches infinity. It says 3 over x times the cosecant of 5 over x. Okay. So, I guess you really have to ask yourself what's going on here. This 3 over x term, as x goes to infinity, what's that approaching? That's approaching 0. So you might think the answer is zero initially, but you, you can't be so certain yet. You have to check what's going on with this other function, cosecant of 5 over x. Well, okay, so the 5 over x term is approaching zero, right? But we're taking the cosecant of the term. So what, can we compute the cosecant of zero? Does that make sense? Well, I guess that would be, to, to be very precise, it would be 1 over sine of 0. Why can't we do that? Because that's 1 over 0, which is undefined, right? What's that? Yeah, you're right. If you think of this as 1 over 0 and this is 0, that's a 0 over 0. This is what the book would call a 0 times infinity indeterminate. Because here's the thing. You guys, like, let me take a really small number, like 1 tenth. 0.1 is pretty small, right? What's 1 divided by 1 tenth? Well, it's 10. But let me take a really small number, like 1 divided by 1 1,000th. One What's that? So see, as, as x approaches infinity, hmm, 
how do I say this? As I put in really small numbers, the sign this is approaching zero, then the whole thing's going to approach infinity. That's kind of what's going on here. Okay. But to do this problem, I think the easiest way to do this problem is, is to kind of do what Mike just did. To not think of it as zero times infinity. Do it this way, guys. Let's do this. Let's write this problem that we were given number 44, is actually equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of 3 over x divided by the sine of 5 over x. Okay? So I guess the point is, if you have a 0 times infinity form, you can actually think of it as a zero over zero form, just by taking the reciprocal of the infinity part. Don't think of it as cosecant, think of it as one over the sine. Now we're in good shape. Question, Duncan? You don't look happy. Mull it over. All right. You guys with me? This is zero over zero? So what do we do? Yeah, but, but before we do L'Hopital's, I'm going to rewrite it because taking the derivatives is not simple this way. So let's rewrite it as 3x to what power? Negative first over, and I'm going to write this as sine, and I'm going to use parentheses when I write 5x to the negative first. Okay, ready to use L'Hopital's. So, what happens? This is the limit as x approaches infinity of what? You do the top, I'll do the bottom. Fair? What's the derivative of the top? Negative 3x to the negative second. Yes. Derivative of the bottom, I'll do. So ding dong, ding. The derivative is cosine of 5x to the negative 1, right? Because the derivative of sine is cosine, times dong. So the derivative of the inside would be negative 5x to the negative second. And the nice thing is, lots of stuff cancels now, right? No, it would be times 1. Because, okay, so let me work it on the side so you can see it. Because you're thinking, what is the derivative of 5x to the negative 1, right? The first part, the cosine of 5x minus 1 to the negative 1. Yeah. That's just ding. And then this, dong, means the derivative of what's inside, basically this. And this derivative would be, if I ignore the 5, it's times negative 1x to the negative 2, so I just wrote it, negative 5x to the negative 2. Okay? So ding dong. Anyways, I was about to um, do some canceling before we take the limit, so let me do that. Limit as x approaches infinity, what does this all equal? Those x to the negative seconds are gone, right? And the negative signs are gone. So it looks like the numerator is just 3. Yeah? And the denominator, I get the cosine. Uh, well, no, I have a 5 there also. 
So I'll put that in front. 5 times the cosine of 5 over x. Okay, what happens as x goes to infinity? We're taking 5 times the cosine of... What happens as x goes to infinity, guys? This gets small. So we're basically taking the cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we have 3 over 5 times 1, which is 3 fifths. So that's the answer, 3 fifths. The book likes to show another way of handling this type of form. So I want to show this problem one more time done kind of like the book does. So I, I just like to start it again here. Let's try one more time. Let's do the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x to the negative 1 over the sine of 5x to the negative 1. This is kind of nice, actually, a nice approach. So I'll show it to you. The book says, let's just change variable here. Let's let t equal 1 over x. If you do that, the fraction gets nicer, right? Because the numerator would just be 3t, right? This is going to make taking derivatives easier, not as messy. Do you guys see this move? Yeah? yeah. And here we have the sign of what? 5t. Duncan? That's what I was going to ask you guys. What's the limit? The limit, when x goes to infinity, what's happening to t? t is approaching what? When x approaches infinity, t gets small and approaches 0. Now, I'm going to write one more symbol that's going to bring you back to your days of chapter 2. What does that mean? <coughs> Do you remember what that means? <coughs> from the positive side or from the right side? And why is that true? Well, because it's 1 over x, right? And when we say x is going to infinity, x is a really big positive number. So t is a really small positive number. So really, this is what, what's going on. OK? So. This, yeah, that's a nice move. You, you start with this and you say, let me substitute in t. And now what happens? Still, I have a 0 over 0, right? So still, I apply L'Hopital. But the derivatives are just nicer. So let's finish the problem. <laughs> this is the limit as t approaches 0 from the positive side of 3 over, and the derivative of sine of 5t would be 5 cosine of 5t, but you, you get the same result. It's just a nice little trick to, to show you guys. Yeah, it just makes the derivatives nicer. You know? So it's kind of a nice little trick. This idea of t equaling 1 over x and, and vice versa is something that we do a lot. Do you guys have any questions on it? Looking at the book real quick, you guys will be doing quick checks, for instance. We can take a look at maybe some of those and kind of see where we go. Here's the theorem itself, right? It says, if the limit as x approaches a of f of x and g of x both are 0, 
That's actually a better way to say the theorem than what I said. You know, if you go back to what I wrote at the beginning, I was thinking about this as we're recording this for the television audience at home. When I wrote this, it's a little bit weak. I mean, what do I mean that the limit is 0 over 0? No, that means you didn't determine the limit. So a better way to say it is, suppose you want to compute that limit, and you have f of a is 0 and g of a is 0. Now, the book is always really precise. It's, it's nice. Sometimes I think it's easier, though, to, to learn calculus from examples than from the book. But then you go back, and the book kind of cements things. OK. So here's the theorem, provided that the right-hand side exists. It says the rule also applies if you have x going to plus or minus infinity, x going to, say, 0 from the positive side or 0 from the negative side. This, this rule applies lots of situations. Oh, yeah. The only thing they prove is a very special case. This is cool to see. So maybe we should do that. So to prove this special case of L'Hopital's rule, okay, here's what we suppose. Suppose we compute the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x. And so we substitute in f of a, g of a, and we get 0 over 0. Suppose that happens. So I guess the question is, why is it that we can then compute the derivatives and go from there? Okay. So the question is, why can we now compute derivatives? to get the answer. I mean, we can always compute derivatives, but why can we now compute derivatives to get the answer? We don't want it to be magic. We want it to be mathematic. So what we look at is let's look at what this means. Limit as x approaches a of f prime of x over g prime of x. Okay. They say that this will be f prime of a over g prime of a. Now, is that true? I did it up here, right? I'm going to say this is true provided that f prime and g prime are, and what's the word that the book uses? Continuous at x equals a. So here's a flashback for you guys. I remember the very first exam, there were a few definitions we had to know. One of them was, a function is continuous. So I'll give you a little reminder of that, right? Right, here it is. f of x is continuous at x equals a means you remember what it means? 
Oh no, you're giving me the definition of that was the one that said limit uh, of f of x equals a, right? The limit as x approaches a. Basically this, the limit as x approaches a of f of x. You're giving me the definition of limit when it equaled l, right? But if the function is continuous, it's really easy to compute the limit. What do you do? Continuous means you just plug in and you get it back. That's what we do all the time, right? Okay. The reason they say special case is because the, what's special is that we're assuming here the derivatives are continuous. If they're not, you can't do this. But if they are, you can do that. Okay, next step. This equals the limit as x approaches a of the difference quotient f of x minus f of a over x minus a. See, I just rewrote f prime of a, right? This is our definition of derivative. Let's rewrite g prime of a. Limit as x approaches a of g of x minus g of a over x minus a. And we had a rule that said the limit of the quotient is the same as the... The limit of the blank is the same as the blank of the limits. So the limit of the quotient is the same as the quotient of the limits. Here's the quotient of two limits. So if I use it backwards, I could say that this equals the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a divided by g of x minus g of a over x minus a. Ooh, we're at 9.25. Out of time. I don't want to hold you after. I mean, the next step is basically to multiply top and bottom by x minus a. f of x minus f of a over g of x minus g of a. And then... The other assumption here was that f of a and g of a are zero, so we get it. Um, but that's it for time, and uh, hey, you guys take it from there. Have a good rest of your day, you guys.